I just realized I still have Cam's picture on the thumbnail. <laughs> Sorry, Greg Boyd, you look like Cam Spires. Fix that in post. Thousand points to Chen. Pine points. Gonna poop on other Christians, Joe. Have I ever pooped on other Christians? Of course not. Have I read Boyd's book? No. I've watched. Um, I've watched two videos of his. And I'm actually going into this one cold. I haven't watched um, this video, but I've, I know where to cue it up where it basically gets into the meat and, and where it starts. So um, the crucifixion of the warrior God, what is this all about? This video is about, I think, something that a lot of Christians struggle with. Not all Christians. Um, let me give my opinion on what I think is um, describes... All personality types. <laughs> you have um, you have the people who are very loving and compassionate. It doesn't matter what religion or what politics they hold dear to. They they basically just loving, compassionate people. And then you got the other types of people who are all for justice, and um, and they're kind of more hard nosed. And so the Christian, the Christian, especially men. I'm going to pick on men. The Christian men who are very much hard-nosed, uh, unemotional, uh, value, justice. What I'm this video is basically not going to impact them one bit. They don't care. I think uh, they don't struggle with Old Testament atrocities. They just said, "Yep, my God's the top God, and if He wants to kill people, so be it." And and it, they sleep soundly at night they're okay with it but then you got the more compassionate men out there and and they say man jesus is all about love and i really struggle when i read the old testament this this doesn't sit right with my soul it it kind of hurts me when i read the old testament <laughs> bold to go into cold yeah joe i'm i'm a bold guy I'm one of those uh, hard-nosed uh, uh, justice guys, so I, I don't care. <laughs> uh, no. So, but this guy, his name is uh, Gregory Boyd. He's a pastor. He actually has a really rough past. I watched a video of his where, um, and Joe, if you haven't seen this, it's a video of his childhood, and he was physically abused terribly by his stepmother. And... I think this is part of the reason why he's the person he is today. He he needed Christianity to pull him out of this his terrible, terrible childhood, and so he's a very uh, I he seems like a very kind, compassionate person. And see, when a Christian closes their eyes and thinks of Jesus, some Christians just think of the first word that pops in their head is love. Um. For other people, it's sacrifice or justice or paid for my sins, um, and it's not love. And so those are the two um, 
Oh, actually, I want to. I, I just got a notification from a guy named Ben who has a Facebook group called "Wrestling with Old Testament Atrocities." Let me double check that. And I'm if you're a Christian watching this and you wrestle with some of these things, I'm going to uh, recommend you look him up on Facebook. He has a pretty big group. Yeah, it's called Wrestling with the Disturbing Parts of Scripture. And um, tell, tell Ben that Atheist Doug sent you. <laughs> I get kickbacks in, in love, you know, and, um, and uh, rewards in heaven for that. So anyhow, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm going to start this video now. And again, I'm going in cold, but I think this is a real uh, issue for a lot of Christians that they struggle with. And uh, let's see how this kind, compassionate pastor deals with Old Testament atrocities. Oh, and by the way, if you guys um, can f uh, put in the chat the verses you, you think are the worst. Like, I don't care if you're a Christian or atheist or Muslim. It doesn't matter who you are. Just put in uh, scripture references that you think are the most troubling to you or to others. And we'll look at those later. Pictures, I have to assume that something else must be going on. And my job is to you know, think of what that, what something else might be. Yeah. And whatever it is, it's going to show me how these portraits actually point to the revelation of God on the cross. Yeah. So something else must be going on, like you said. Um, I don't want to get into the details of your proposal quite yet, but can you ex explain how you came to this view generally? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I actually started to write this book about 10 years ago, um, but the book I was starting to write was not the book I ended up writing. I, I was getting all these questions about the Old Testament violent God, and so I thought I need to write a short book. Uh, it was taking me a summer, no longer, and, and I, it was going to be a book of all the best arguments I collected over the last 20 years. I've always read up on this topic and, and saved the best arguments as to why God had to act so violently in the Old Testament and trying to justify the genocide, justify, you know, smashing families together. What I find interesting is, is that there's been books and books and books written on this topic and it's, it's for Christians uh, and maybe even Jews, I don't know, to try to, to consolidate the picture of God or Jesus in their head with what they're reading in the Old Testament. And, and they're just struggling so hard with this. Yeah, I, all, all of it. Um, you, you just kind of give the best possible spin you can on it. And I got about 50 pages into this book and I had to stop and admit that it sucked. It, it, I just felt like the answers weren't compelling. It weren't, they didn't convince me that I saw all sorts of holes in them. Uh, they once seemed com compelling, but now they honestly didn't seem uh, persuasive at all. And I want to really uh, applaud Gregory Boyd here. He's basically saying, look, I've read all these great writers on how they uh, deal with this issue, and I thought they were all terrible. But not only that, what was even worse is that I came to the awareness that the job, the task, isn't just to make God look a, less, look a little less monstrous, maybe even look nice. That's not the task. Jesus says all scripture is about him. Um, and, and, and Luke 24, it's all about his suffering on the cross. Um, it all is supposed to, all scripture is supposed to point towards the self-sacrificial, enemy-embracing, nonviolent love of God revealed on Calvary. So yeah, and um, I am not 100% sure about this, but I think Gregory Boyd is a Trinitarian. I think he worshiped Jesus as God. I think, uh, and Joe, you can cr uh, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think he would say Jesus Christ is not a prophet of God or is just the son of God, but he is God incarnate. So the question, even if, uh, even, even if the best explanations worked as to, to make God look a little better, you still haven't shown how a genocidal picture of God or any other violent portrait of God actually points to the cross. Uh, and so I was, I was asking the wrong question. I cannot conclude. So then for a long time, uh, I just sat in the question. I, on Jesus' authority, I've got to accept all this as the inspired word of God. Why? Why do you have to accept this, all of it, as the inspired word of God? And I think I know the answer to this. And the answer is, um, if you start picking and choosing what's inspired and what's not, you run into a huge problem as a Christian. You start thinking, well, maybe 
God had nothing to do with any of it. It's that slippery slope type thinking. And so for a lot of Christians out there, this is where the struggle begins. They have to consolidate, reconcile these Old Testament verses with the picture of the loving Jesus who gave himself for them. But really, I, I've talked to so many people, and I, I know I'm going to get criticisms for saying this, but I think the real issue here is guys like Gregory Boyd and people who struggle with these, with these issues, they've had some deep personal experience of what they think is this God described in the Bible. They think that this God saved their lives, not even just eternal life, but their lives on earth from depression, anxiety, addiction, um, hopelessness, broken marriages, bankruptcy. If they start saying to themselves, maybe the Bible's not inspired, then they, there's this like, it's like a sword goes through their heart of the fear that all those bad things that they think Jesus saved them from is going to come back. Now, I could be wrong about this, but I really think this is the real issue for many Christians. They are terrified that if this is not true, if the Bible's not mostly true, like, what is the point of life? I might as well just kill myself. I, like, why, why do anything good for people? I've talked to people who, who say things like this, and it's very frightening. I, and, and I've also said that I think atheists are freaks of nature because we don't need that. We don't need this person watching over us and, um, and this idea of eternity to find meaning and purpose in life. And, uh, and so, but I do realize that most people do. And so if you're an atheist, I think you should call yourself a freak. Uh, but also on Jesus' authority, I can't accept the, the surface meaning of these violent portraits of God. Something else must be going on. And I just sat in that conundrum, followed the advice of origin. It just says, we've got to wait on the Spirit, and he'll reveal the deeper truths that will resolve contradictions. And um, in time, I, I... What did he say? Uh, wait on the Holy Spirit, and that will resolve contradictions. You know, <laughs> Gregory Boyd, if you ever listen to this, this is what Mormons say, too. You know, if there's something you don't understand about the Book of Mormon, just pray about it. Just have the Holy Spirit. God will direct you. I actually began to have, I, I began to think I saw how, I, I, how, how these portraits actually point to, to, to Christ. It was like a, a little bit and, and time. Jesus Garcia says, I'm a Christian. I'm not worried, Doug, uh, or scared. Um, you're not worried at all if the if, um, whole Bible's basically false, the, the core propositions, that you, there's no existential angst in you at all if, if you just die and you're warm food. I will tell whether people think this is revelation or this is madness, me seeing the face in the cloud, you know, I don't know. But I'll just tell you what happened. It's, it's like what happens when, when you look at one of those magic eye books. You know, those, it looks like just you have all this random wallpaper. But if you look at it just the right way, with a lazy eye, or you look through the page, not at the page, and they have all these techniques, you know, that, that all of a sudden a three-dimensional object will start arising out of the page. If you look at it the right way. The first time I ever encountered one of these was in the early 90s. Uh, we were at a Christmas party, and they're passing around this magic eye book. And everyone was seeing these dolphins, like, oh, there's the three dolphins, they're so, you know. And, and they pass it on, the next person would spend a minute, but all of a sudden they see the dolphins. It gets to me, and there's no dolphins. It's, it's like, I was like, I, I don't see any dolphins here. And oh, you gotta look, you gotta look through the pages. Let, 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 let your eye go lazy, all this stuff. And I could not see anything. And I actually thought of there. I actually got to the point where I suspected they were playing a prank on me. That this was actually just a book of wallpaper, and they're claiming to see dolphins, and there wasn't any dolphins. But the lady uh, who hosted the party let me take the book home. I think he's telling the story to, to just demonstrate that people will see what they're been conditioned to see. And uh, for two weeks, I was trying to find <laughs> these dimensional. And I finally, there was a, it was supposed to be the simplest one. It was, a, I had a heart. And I was downstairs looking at it on the sofa while Shelly was upstairs getting ready for bed because it takes her four times as long to get ready for bed. 
Uh, Gonzo, uh, sorry for your, uh, there's some great comments in, in the live stream, so that's why I'm stopping and starting. Um, Gonzo says, why should we be scared uh, if the Bible, the core propositions of the Bible are false? If we die and we're worm food, then we won't know or regret anything. Well, let, let me give you some uh, reasons why you should be scared if you leave, if Christianity is false. Um, because your spouses might still believe it's true. And if you leave Christianity... Uh, 90% of people who watch my videos are men. So I'm going to say, if you're a Christian listening right now, and if you became convinced someday that Christianity is false, the core propositions, your wife is going to cry for a year. You realize this, right? She will be devastated. There's just a very pragmatic reason why um, leaving Christianity is, is um, not fun. But as it does me. So I'm reading this, I'm looking at this, and all of a sudden... I begin to see it. it. It kind of comes and goes. Like it's kind of like I could see it, and then I disappeared. But then it came back, and then I and then it got really clear. And I holler up, you know, upstairs, Shelly, I see it, I see it. And I, I had to actually walk upstairs like this. But I didn't want to take my eye off the thing because I thought if I lose it, I'll never get it back again. And so it's like I could actually see it. Well, that's kind of like what happened with these Old Testament violent portraits. Is that as I'm reading them, and I have a whole. You know, he's calling them portraits, the Old Testament portraits. Would would Gregory Boyd say that? the crucifixion and resurrection of, uh, of Jesus is a portrait and may not actually be reflecting something real from God. A whole list of 60 pages of all this nasty stuff. And I believe this is inspired by God. And it must somehow point to the cross, but I don't know how. And, and, but I, I trust that God looks like this. And as I did that, that's when I began to see, like, I actually see the cross in the midst of these violent portraits. I, I begin to see what else was going on, and what else is going on, I think, is the same thing that was going on when God revealed himself on the cross. He sees the cross in the midst of the Old Testament genocides and so forth. Well, I, I can see how you can see the cross in that, because the cross itself is a bloody crucifixion-type scene um, of human sacrifice in order to um, save the world. I'm not sure what Gregory Boyd's um, theology is on on uh, the crucifixion, why Jesus had to die, and uh, if he's penal substitution or victory over the devil or what. Um, there's so many different theologies out there that Christians struggle with trying to decide what they really believe. Okay. Uh, so we're almost to the point where we're going to ask you to, to explain that. But before we get there, this has got to be a problem that other theologians have wrestled with. Yeah. So why couldn't you accept any of their proposals? <laughs> I can just get along, go. <laughs> okay, we've got three options, um, and they've all been explored in church history. On, on the one hand, you have this option where people just reject it. They say it doesn't agree with what Jesus reveals about God. So they, they, it's, I call it the dismissal solution. And you have people in the early church who did that. And you have people today, increasing numbers of people who are doing that. They just say, it didn't happen, so kind of don't worry about it. Yeah, and the, the advantage of that solution is, so basically he's saying you're a Christian, you just, you just reject the Old Testament stuff that you don't like. Um, that's the simplest, easiest way to go. But the problem with that is once you start down that road, then you have to be open to the idea of rejecting some of the New Testament stuff that you don't like. And it doesn't sit well with you because even people who cherry pick at some point realize they're cherry picking. Um, then the second solution is the one that's most common since the fifth century. And that, that is you, you take the revelation of God uh, in, in, in Jesus Christ, and then you take all the Old Testament portraits of God and you sort of squish them together. I call this the synthesis solution. So yeah, Jesus reveals God, but, but so do these other pictures. And so you come up with kind of a, uh, a montage picture of God. Um, yeah, the problem with that synthesis idea, though, is y you have this idea of God, of Jesus being loving, would never hurt a child, but then he kills children in the Old Testament. That's hard to synthesize that. Jesus reveals, they, they, they would even say throughout church, church history, that this is, Jesus is the fullest revelation of God. But these other pictures... Yeah, Joe De DePilato says Greg Boyd rejects penal substitutionary atonement. I, uh, that'd be my guess, too. I, I truly believe a lot of theology is based on personality types, and I, his personality type is one of compassion and love and so forth. And so um, if I was a betting man, I would guess he doesn't uh, subscribe to, um, to that whole idea that, um, that Jesus was uh, a ransom, but he was more the victor over 
over sin. They also are given authority to reveal what God's really like. The third option is one that was prevalent in the early church for the first three, four centuries of the church. Uh, I call this the reinterpretation uh, approach. And these, a lot of theologians like Origen and others, um, they embraced the whole Old Testament as inspired because Jesus taught them this. But also because they also saw rightly that the New Testament doesn't present Jesus' uh, revelation of God as one revelation among others. It's rather the revelation that culminates and supersedes all others. And so rather than, than putting that revelation of, of God in Christ alongside the violent pictures of God, they, they put him, him over these violent pictures and interpreted them through the lens of, of Christ, which is what I think the New Testament tells us to do. And they would find interpretations of, of, of these passages that, that uh, actually pointed towards the revelation of God in, in Christ, and especially on, on the cross. See, but when I was a former Christian, thinking back um, when I was a Christian, that wouldn't sit well with me either. That to, He's basically, he's not coming out and saying this, but he's basically saying you take the New Testament and you put it on top of the Old Testament, that the New Testament trumps the Old Testament. But then I'm thinking of verses... Like, not a jot or tittle will be removed uh, from the Old Testament. Um, that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Um, and that there's so many um, things that I think the, the New Testament authors took from the Old Testament in order to create the narrative of the, of the New Testament. Uh, some people would say, well, these things actually happened, and God was working throughout Scripture. But I think you can't really put one on top of the other. They go hand in hand, um, in my opinion. So in other words, I'm saying all three of these options I don't like. And my guess is maybe Boy doesn't like them either. Uh, Origen would say things like this. Uh, when it comes to things that are unworthy of God, and these theologians all thought that the, the violent pictures of God are unworthy of him because the worthy picture is what Jesus reveals. But he says, when you come to pictures of God that are unworthy of him, uh, you have to look through the surface, look into the depth of the text and, and see what is God saying in the depth of the text and my own depth of the text see when I hear that I'm hearing we got to nuance it to death so we can make it fit to the idea of Jesus in our brains approach it doesn't agree with those in every respect but it follows that tradition the reinterpretation tradition okay. you don't dismiss it but you also don't accept the surface meaning of, of the passages okay so now it's time in a nutshell, can you explain the essence of your view? I know you spent 1,400 pages doing this, but can you briefly, you know? Just... No, I can't. I just can't. I, I have no idea how I'm going to do that. Can you try? Uh, okay, I'll try. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so and this is... Belief By the way, he's going to... Uh, I've, I've seen enough to know that he's going to go into some specific examples in the Old Testament, and I'm going to do the same thing. So if you do have... Uh, verses in mind, uh, tag me, and I'll bring it up here, and we'll go through some of these together. And I'll show you a strategy that I've used with Christians um, to talk about these things. Believe me, this is, the, this is a <laughs> molecule on one snowflake on the tip of a very big iceberg, all right? So you're, you're getting, but hopefully this will give just the gist of it. And what's going to make me out of worse is I'm going to try to draw something. Um, so for me, I began to get this magic eye, if you will, this magic eye vision of, of, of how the Old Testament bears witness to, to Christ. When I asked this... <laughs> I'm actually impressed with him that he, he admits, he uses this language, a magic eye vision interpretation of, of Jesus and how to fit it with the Old Testament. He's not even hiding the fact that he's, he's just like a magician pulling stuff out of a hat to make it fit. This question, and it's a question I've never heard anyone ask before, but it's, once I asked it, it seems like the most obvious question in the world. And that is, how does the cross, how does Jesus Christ on a cross, how does that become the definitive revelation of God for us? Um, because look, if you look at Jesus Christ... Uh, you know what I just thought of when he said, how does the cross become the definitive revelation for us? It's the, the whole idea of... Um, Islam being the final revelation popped into my head when he said that. And it's sort of like, you know, the, the Muslims would say, this is the final word of God found in the Quran. 
He's almost saying the same thing. The final revelation, the the pinnacle revelation is the cross and kind of, you know, you know, the Old Testament's very important. It's inspired, but this is the meat. And but this is how a Muslim would talk. This yeah, yeah, the, the gospels, the Injils or whatever they call it. Um, yeah, it's good. Um, Old Testament, yes, yeah, we believe that's uh, Allah speaking there too. But the Quran, this is the real revelation. Christ crucified. I always draw that too long. I never get that to match up. Um, if you just look at the cross with the natural eye, you don't, you don't see God revealing himself. What you see is a, a crucified Jew. If you look at it from a first century perspective, you're seeing a, a God-forsaken crucified criminal. Uh, no different than all the other crucified criminals that the Romans crucified. What is it about this particular crucified criminal that makes him the definitive revelation of God for us? And it occurred to me that it, it, it's not, and, and this is an important question because if, as I, I argue that as the New Testament pre presents it, the cross is, is the, the, the full definitive revelation of God. And so all of our thinking about God. He stutters a lot for a pastor. I, I actually never noticed that before. It needs to be based on the cross. It, it, that should be our starting point. So how God reveals himself on the cross becomes kind of the paradigm for how he reveals himself. Well, here what I noticed, what I noticed was this. It's not what we see, we, what we and everyone else see on the surface that is the definitive revelation of God. Uh, what, what you see on the surface is a, is a guilty God for Satan criminal, and it's ugly, it's horrific. But he becomes the full revelation of God for us when we, by faith, see what else is going on. There's something else going on. And what's going on? But not, this, not everyone can see this, only those who are, have faith. Whoa, not everyone can see this, only those who have faith. What do you think he's talking about here? I don't think Gregory Boyd's a Calvinist, but maybe he is. But this is how Calvinists talk. I call it the special sauce. Um, if you don't have the special sauce, the X factor, the Holy Spirit, you're not going to see this. It, we see that God, well, I'll just symbolize with a triangle, it stepped into this and became this guilty. Ah, yes. You notice he drew a triangle there. That tells me he's a Trinitarian. Guilty God-forsaking criminal. All right? Uh, yeah, so he stepped into... Oh, I'll stop right there. Uh, when well, it comes to us, here's, here's us. So, so the cross, we're looking at the cross, and we know by faith that God stooped an infinite distance to become a human being and then to become our sin and to become our curse. He actually experiences his, his own... In antithesis, and he does it out of love for us. And what reveals God? I have no idea how this helps him deal with the Old Testament atrocities, but maybe he'll bring it around here. God to us is this. It's, it's the distance he crosses to become this crucified criminal. Um, and the, if, the fact that he, he went as far as he could possibly go, even becoming his antithesis, becoming a whole holy God becoming sin, and the perfectly united God taking on our God forsakenness, the infinitude of the distance he crossed reveals the infinite perfection of the love that he is. But to see this, you have to look through the surface and to see what else is going on. Well, if that's how God revealed himself in his full revelation to us, and this is why it's the full revelation, because here he crosses a distance that he couldn't ever surpass. If that's how God revealed... I'm totally lost right now, what he's saying. To me, this is just a bunch of words um, let's see if he can <laughs> help me here at the end. He himself on the cross, and the cross is to be the center of all of our thinking about God. And the cross reveals what God's truly like. It reveals what God's always like. So it reveals what God's like when he inspires the Bible. <clears throat> the cross reveals what God's truly like, that he has to kill his son in order to save mankind. That's what I'm getting out of this. So shouldn't we read the Bible expecting that there might come times where it's not the surface that reveals God, it's what we know is going on behind the scenes that reveals God. Uh, in fact, the surface, the surface... <laughs> it's what's behind the scenes that reveals God? Isn't that a oxymoron? Oxymoron? Like, he's saying that in order to know God, you have to know the hidden God, what's underneath the surface. The surface of, of, of the revelation of God in Christ is horrendously ugly. This is why the cross is simultaneously supremely beautiful and supremely ugly. If you look at the surface, it's supremely <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for this, but to me, God sounds like a woman. <laughs> it's not what I said, it's what I meant. 
ugly. Because the Son of God is bearing trouble. the sin of the world. And, and, and he's beaten beyond recognition. And, and so it's, it's horrifically ugly. But if you look at it with the eyes of faith, it's supremely beautiful. Because you see through the ugly surface to the beauty of a God who... When you look through the eyes of faith, it's beautiful. Like, this is why I love the outsider test of faith so much. Because when you look at the Book of Mormon through the eyes of faith... It's beautiful. When you look at the Quran through the eyes of faith, it is beautiful. When you read the Vedas as a Hindu using faith, it is beautiful. This works every time it's tried. Who stoops to bear the sin of his people. And if this is how God's always like, he's always been stooping to bear the sin of his people and therefore taking on a semblance, an appearance that mirrors that ugliness, just like he does in the cross. The surface mirrors our sin back to us. It's God stepping into it that reveals God to us. So also, shouldn't we read the Bible knowing that sometimes we might find ugly portraits of God and the surface of those ugly portraits, they tell us not what God's really like, they tell us a lot about the sin that God's bearing. This is how his people... View the portraits of God don't tell us what God's really like? Well, then how is it a portrait? Oh, I wish I could rewind this, um, but I can't easily. Um, I think he said the portrait of God doesn't really tell us who God is. What use is having the portrait then? Viewed him. But what re reveals God to us in these pictures is that we know that God is like the heavenly missionary who is always willing to stoop how, how, however low he needed a stoop to bear the sin of his people. Because he's not a coercive God, he influences as much as he can. But He's not a coercive God? Is there at least a few examples where he's coer coercive? Like think of um, uh, Judas. Uh, did he not coerce? Like, did Judas have free will not to betray Jesus? <laughs> Maybe he did. I don't know. Uh, think of... Um, uh, the plagues, uh, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Is that an example of God being coercive? It sure sounds like it. But there comes a point where he has to accept people as they are. And this is where his people were. And so he, 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 he bears that sin. And therefore, in the Bible, which is the inspired record of his covenantal faithfulness, he takes on an appearance that mirrors the sin of his people. When we come to those things, we have to exercise the same faith we exercise. He takes the appearance mirroring the sins of his people? Whoa, I can... I, <laughs> if there's some conservative evangelical Christians watching right now, they're, they're not happy with Gregory Boyd right now. Um, he's making God sound like, like a human. When we see the cross as the full revelation of God. See, past, see the sin surface? That reflects the sin of his people. But beyond that, we see a God, a humble God, who's willing to stoop to bear their sin. In a, a humble God who is jealous of other gods. In a nutshell. In is a that nutshell, nutshell enough for that you? That was pretty nutshelly. Good. Okay. Um, so you're saying that in the Old Testament, God is actually allowing he'll, himself to be seen in a way that he's not really. Oh, in, in but, fact, you can... Whoa! That's a great question. I, and I, I paused it because I want to try to predict his answer. He has to say no to that because that question makes it sound like God is deceptive. So uh, let's see how Gregory Boyd's going to evade this question. Well, well maybe, I was well, gonna, uh, let me say this. No, you. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I want to, get, like, you find this throughout the Bible. It's, it's, it's um, uh, not just an inference. Like, for example, God never wanted a king. He never wanted Israel to have a king. Um, he wanted to be their only king. But there came a point where the Israelites cried and whined and all that stuff. And so God finally said, fine, they're rejecting me. Give them a king. Now, once yeah, Ed, I can totally understand that. You know, when the Israelites, they whined and cried, they wanted a king. So finally God gave in and gave them a king. You know, I'm the same way when my children, they, if they really want something like a cookie, you know, if they whine and cry a long, long enough, I'll give them that cookie because that's just the great dad I am. <laughs> Once God does that, he, 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 you'd swear he was a king-approving deity after that. 
just like all the other ancient Near Eastern deities were. Kingship was a big deal in the ancient Eastern world. It was the center of their politics and the center of their religion. And the gods always operated a certain way through the kings. You don't find any of that in the Bible up until 1 Samuel 8, when God says, okay, fine, I'll give you a king. And then all of a sudden, God looks like a typical ancient Near Eastern deity who's relating to the people through this kingship. And he, he doesn't say... He, and all of a sudden, he looks like a typical uh, ancient deity like all the others. Isn't that interesting? Say, I told you so, even when the kingship's going bad, he, once he decides to play a role, he plays it and he takes on an appearance. Or an, another example would be uh, polygamy. Um, you know, God, monogamy was always God's ideal. Uh, but we find that polygamy comes in this world because it's a fallen world, and then divorce and remarriage, and then they even do this concubine thing where they're not really married, but they can bear children. And the thing is that once God accepts that, once God accepts that, this is crazy. Actually, I, <laughs> I'm getting a little... I'm getting a little uh, riled up. I feel like George on Seinfeld. <laughs> it's like, George is getting upset. Um, once God accepts that, it's almost like Gregory Boyd is painting Yahweh as some deity that grades morality on a cultural curve. I really, I really don't like polygamy, but man, since you guys are doing it, well, okay, I'll allow it. Um, I really don't want a king, but uh, since you guys really wind i guess i'll allow it it's like uh, you know slavery yeah it's not really good to own people but yeah since you guys really want it yeah i'll i'll allow it, it often if you didn't know better you'd think he, that polygamy was his idea like that he, he approves of it um he even says to David, you know, I blessed you with all of Saul's wives and concubines, and I would have given you more if you wanted. And so it's like he, he, he takes on that role, and, and, uh, but we know. Yeah, the Bible is very clear. The Old Testament is clear that um, um, King Solomon had 900 wives. What, or was it 900, 700? I forget what it is. But I, I often like to ask question, questions like, was the Bible in error when they called them wives? Or... Was it really one wife and 699 um, adulteresses? That's something else is going on because God doesn't really approve of polygamy. He's just bearing the people's sin and therefore taking on an appearance that reflects that sin. Or bearing the sin of kingship. And taking on the appearance to reflect that sin. He's saying that God allowed this to look sinful? I'm totally confused here. I know Joe DiPilato, you kind of like this guy. I'm, um, uh, I, I've, I feel sorry for the Christians who like this guy now. <laughs> I really do. Like, I can totally understand why Christians will see or hear this teaching and just turn the opposite direction and run. And taking out a, a semblance that reflects that. I, he does the same thing with violence. Uh, it comedies, yeah. But are, are you saying then that those violent judgments didn't take place. No. No, I, I am not saying that. Um, we got to move your stool over. I'm oh, sorry, sorry. I'm getting too close to you? Well, I like you. Just like me, they want to be <laughs> close to you. Uh. Um, uh, what I said at the beginning of this live stream, I think, is, is very true. You're looking at a guy who's had a personal experience of Jesus, and he has to reconcile it desperately. Um, to what he sees in the Old Testament. It, it is life or death for him. And in my opinion, he is flailing like a fish on a dock um, trying to make sense of this. Um, no, I, I, here's the thing. I, I, I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and so I treat everything in there as factual. And so the judgments, I think... He treats everything in the Bible as factual? that the earth was created before the sun? Does he think that's factual? Are factual. The judgments, the flood really happened, Sodom and Gomorrah really happened. All those things really happened. Um, I just believe that, that um, because of the cross... Okay. Oh, man, I wish he would come on my live stream. Because if he would say something like that to me, he says the flood really happened, Sodom and Gomorrah really happened. I would ask him, did Jesus commanding the genocide, or Yahweh commanding the genocide of uh, women and children. Did that really happen? Did that commandment from the lips of Yahweh or Jesus, did that really happen? And my guess is he's gonna say no. So why is it that he believes the flood really happened, Sodom and Gomorrah really happened,
but not the words coming out of the deity to say kill children that that didn't happen we have got we know more about god than they did uh we've got this full revelation and and so that gives us some that gives us a, a an ability to see things that old testament authors couldn't always see that well um the most important thing is this you know on the cross here we have a paradigm for what it looks like when God brings judgment on sin. And all of our thinking needs to be anchored in the cross. Uh, Jesus is bearing the sin of the world and the judgment that, that comes with that sin. But notice that God the Father didn't have to act violently to bring this judgment about. God the Father never lifted a finger towards Jesus. All the violence done towards Jesus... Uh, was done by, by wicked humans who are operating under the influence of principalities and powers. It was done by agents other than God. Oh. What he's saying is, God just allowed it. He actually didn't do it, so he's not the bad guy. Wasn't this plan of redemption a plan from the beginning of creation, Mr. Boyd? Wasn't this whole idea of redemption, Jesus dying on the cross and rising, part of God's plan from the very beginning. And for you to say, God really didn't do it. it he just kind of allowed it. Uh, that doesn't seem to add up to me. So there was violence in this judgment, but it wasn't God who did it. The only thing that God did to bring about this judgment on Christ was he allowed it. Um, he, he, he withdrew his protection and, and allowed these violent humans to do what they already wanted to do. He allowed it. He withdrew his protection. Think about Yahweh uh, before he created anything. He really didn't uh, make Satan into Satan. He just allowed it. Think about that. Think about God creating angels. And he didn't make them uh, fall. He just withdrew, withdrew everything that it took to keep them um, obeying him and worshiping him. That's a very, very fine line between allowing and doing. Uh, and so you have this motif where it says, uh, the, the Father delivered over Jesus to these wicked human beings. He gave him up. Um, and this is why Jesus cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he's experiencing the inside of the forsakenness that is intrinsic to all sin. But the father wasn't, wasn't violent. So as we read the Bible, as we read the Bible, we should do it through that lens. Interpret. We know... Okay, if, if uh, Mr. Pastor Boyd was in my live stream, I would ask him if God was violent on the definition of violence that most humans have, would you leave Christianity? If you became convinced that the, God, the portrait of Yahweh actually is violence, would you give it Christianity up? Is this... Uh, a make or break situation for you. Oh, that when God judges folks, all he needs to do is withdraw and allow sin to run its course and allow other agents who, are in, who want to act violently to do what they want to do. And as a matter of fact, when you start reading the... Yeah, um, if I give a gun to my child, I'm not responsible if my child um, kills people with it. Um, He's the one who held the gun. I'm not at all responsible for giving someone who doesn't even know how to use a gun, uh, giving them a gun. No, that, none of that's my fault. The Bible, through that lens, you'll see it everywhere. And I've got about 200 pages on, on this thing. Uh, God's judgments are usually described as uh, him hiding his face, turning away, delivering people over to the consequences of their sin. Uh, you have all these passages about how your sin shall punish you. People bring their punishment on themselves. Your violence will ricochet back on you. And, and all that God does is he, just, he, works, he, he works mercifully to try to protect us from the consequences of our sin as long as possible. But if it ever gets to the point where he's simply enabling us in our sin and causing us to be further entrenched in our sin, then he withdraws with a grieving heart and allows... He, he's painting this picture that it's all, all the bad stuff is human's fault. Pastor Boyd, may I remind you that the God you worship and believe in drowned 99.9% .9 of the human population, or at least 99% of the population in that geographical area, area, if you don't believe in the global flood. May, 
can I remind you that your God sent the waters forth from the sky and from the ground to drown babies, women, children? Allows us, he lets us go and says, you know, have it your way. Um, and then there's a, a, other agents that come in and carry out the violence that, that is a part of, of uh, God's judgments. Now, here's the thing, is that Old Testament authors didn't always see that clearly. You, you find it all over the place, but right alongside of that, you'll find that authors ascribe violence directly to God. And, and here's what's going on there, and this is part of what God has to accommodate, is that in the ancient Near Eastern world, the primary way you praise a deity is by ascribing violence to that deity. And the more violence, the more you're praising him, and the more macabre the violence, the more you're praising him. That's just, they, 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 they gloated, our God danced in the blood of your children, kind of thing, you know? It, it was just barbaric, but that's what everybody does. And these ancient Near Eastern countries, when they would go to war and slaughter another army, they knew that they did the slaughtering, but every one of them, without exception, attributes their violence to their God. Um, even though they know their God didn't actually do it. Uh, but it's insulting not to attribute your violence to God. Old Testament authors are conditioned. Aren't there verses in the Old Testament that says that if it weren't for Yahweh, they would have lost? That it was actually God himself that caused the victory? By their culture, and this is the point where we have to see something they couldn't always see. What's interesting is they simultaneously, all over the place, hundreds of times, will say God did it, and then they'll say God merely allowed it, and someone else did it. And this is because they're giving their own ancient Near Eastern spin on, on, on the judgments. That the judgments happened was absolutely correct. Yeah, by the way here, I agree with what Boyd's saying. Uh, when you look at it from the lens of um, that this God's not real, <laughs> it becomes very, very simple. Yeah, the people, uh, they have needed to justify their actions. They needed to get people behind um, the generals of the day and say, look, God told us to do this. we got to do this. He's guaranteed us victory or whatever. And so it increases morale. When you look at it from that lens, yeah, I, I totally get it. But here's the problem. Uh, Pastor Boyd, you believe that this book called the Bible, the Old Testament, is in the inspired word of a deity. And, that, and you've said already that everything in it you think is factual, that whatever purports to be true is true. And it says that God uh, told Moses to do these heinous things. Now, do you believe that or not? Correct. Uh, what they didn't see clearly is that God is, 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 is altogether nonviolent. And so they fall into the cultural pattern of, of, uh, of, of ascribing to God violence that he actually merely allowed. Okay. And then God has to accommodate that. He influences it as much as possible to go in a different direction. But insofar as it's necessary, he accommodates that and bears their sin and therefore takes on an appearance in the record of his covenantal faithfulness uh, that, that makes it look like he, in fact, engaged in and commanded that violence when, in fact, he merely allowed it. Okay. Uh, so let's go through this with a couple passages. Let's do it. Oh, this is going to be good. Um, Exodus 12, this will be a story most of us know. I'm just going to read part of that uh, book, and then we can see how your view uh, is a way of interpreting this. So Exodus 12, 12. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgments on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be assigned for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. That's God talking. Mm. That's God talking. I'm going to even make this more real. Let's see if I can bring this up here. Um, oh, that's uh, for Samuel. Uh, what did he say? Exodus 12, 12, something like that. I got the, um, uh, what did I do? Hang on. Well, let me play this while I get the Bible Gateway back. That's a portrait of God. Yes. Uh, an author is given a portrait of God. A portraits always or often involve God talking. Uh, but you got to know this, that when, when, God, when God's revealed on the cross, it, it involves what appears is a result both of God acting toward us, but also God allowing people to act toward him. And a portrait is beautiful insofar as God acts towards us, but it's ugly insofar as we act toward him. The surface reveals us acting toward him. What's going on behind the scenes is God acting toward us. 
chew on that for a little bit. Uh, so with, with portraits, if we're looking at them through the lens of the cross, we always have to be asking the question, when, when we find portraits that, that fall short of the character that's revealed in Christ, we gotta know something else is going on. This is just hand waving. Uh, the interviewer asked him, you know, this is God saying this. Uh, do you believe this or not, basically? Going on. Um, now, because of the cross, I already know that even though this author would, uh, assumes that Yahweh is capable of slaughtering children, and th that passage reveals it, even though he thinks that, I know that God doesn't slaughter children. Jesus, I don't think, would kill a baby for any reason. Um, and <laughs> How can he say that after saying that he believes that the flood actually happened? How can he say that God doesn't kill children knowing that the flood happened? I, I don't understand where this guy's coming from. And, and, uh, and a lot more can be said in defense of that. Sure. But uh, so there, I assume that what, whatever violence went on in this passage, it was done by agents other than God. Now what I found interesting is that what, when I approach the text with that assumption, almost always I can find in the text itself proof that the agent who engaged in violence wasn't God. And it's stuff I never would have noticed if I hadn't been wearing this lens. But once I wear this lens, the, these authors themselves make it clear that God didn't actually do the violence that they themselves attribute to him. So for example, in, in uh, Exodus 12, uh, read verse 23. 23, when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. So that's quite different now. Now, when he sees the blood on the doorpost, he won't, if there's a house that lacks blood on the doorpost, he will not stop the destroyer from going in and killing the firstborn. So apparently there's a destroyer out there who wants to kill all the firstborn, and Yahweh's always been preventing them. But now, in certain circumstances, he'll allow it to happen. Um, but it's not Yahweh who's doing it. Now, to, to the first sentence. Okay, let me, uh, let me bring this up here. This is Exodus 12, 12. Um, let's go right to the top here. While Moses and Aaron were still in Egypt, the Lord spoke to them. So this is my advice uh, for non-Christians, how to read this to Christians. When Moses and Aaron were still in Egypt, Jesus spoke to them. Jesus said, and he goes on. Um, uh, and we'll sc scroll down to verse 12. Tonight, tonight Jesus will go through Egypt and kill every firstborn man and animal in Egypt. In this way, Jesus will judge all the gods of Egypt and show that he is Jesus. But the blood on your houses will be a special sign. When Jesus sees the blood, I will pass over your house. <laughs> now, I think Greg Boyd said, no, no, this is not Jesus. This is um, the devil or something. I don't know. Um, I will cause bad things to happen to the people in, in Egypt, but none of these bad diseases will, will, will hurt you. Jesus will cause bad things to happen to the people of Egypt. None of these bad diseases will hurt you. Am I wrong here? Am I wrong to say this is not God talking? Now, I, I realize that a lot of liberal Christians will say, no, this is, this, is, you know, this is just men writing stuff, and I agree with them. But if you're a Christian who uh, leans conservative, um, wouldn't you have to say that Jesus is killing every firstborn man in Egypt? I think so. To the, to the original author, that distinction wasn't very important because they thought God was capable of violence. So whether he's the destroyer or not is inconsequential. But for us, as we're reading this through the lens of the cross, that becomes a, a really important distinction. Because uh, it's what our cross perspective would lead us to expect in the first place. Okay, so he's saying that because the Christians of today have a better perspective because they have more revelation called the New Testament, we can now look back on these Old Testament atrocities and view it from that lens. What if Gregory Boyd, sometime in the future, um, we can look back on the New Testament and say, 
with a new lens and say, well, Jesus never really said these things in the New Testament because um, the New Testament people didn't know what we know today, and therefore, you know, that Jesus never really said these things. I think, uh, Pastor Boyd, you would say, no, 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 it's the final revelation, it's done. Well, this is what the Jews th thought too. You know, the Old Testament, the Torah was the final revelation and the prophets, it's done. You pesky Christians, you added to the word of God by creating this New Testament. That there's a destroyer out there, and ultimately all the killing, stealing, and destroying that goes on in this world is a result of, of a destroyer using other agents that are vulnerable to him. It's not God doing it. That's what I'm proposing. Okay. Should we do one more? It's not God doing it. If God did do it, Boyd, is, are you done with Christianity? Is this the line in the sand? Is this the marker that you have? That if, if you became convinced, like, I would say you're in a minority position. Well, I don't know. Let's say you're, you represent 50% of Christians, which I think is high. Um, like, is, is this the end for you? If you became, became convinced that, no, this, if, if the Bible's inspired, if this is the word of God, um, and if God and Jesus are, if there's only one God, then Jesus said, I will kill every firstborn man an animal in Egypt, if, if you're saying that really didn't happen, I think you're in trouble. I think you now have to doubt uh, the New Testament stuff, sayings of Jesus as well. Um, don't we have a lens today, looking back at the New Testament, to say, you know, maybe Jesus didn't say the things he said as the Gospel writers. Maybe the Gospel writers were just using the Old Testament and as um, sort of... Um, an outline to create a, a story of a character. You know, maybe there was a real Jesus that walked around, but maybe this character is just that, a character portrayed in the Gospels. Um, and maybe, just like you said, you say that Jesus didn't, or God didn't do these things in the Old Testament, maybe Jesus didn't say and do the things in the New Testament. Where do you draw this line, <clears throat> Pastor Boyd? Doesn't this bother you? that you're picking and choosing like this. I want to bring up um, a couple other, I'm not sure, I, I have no idea if they go into more verses here. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter seven is a good one. Um, let's see here. Again, yeah. Let's put this in terms of Jesus. Uh, Jesus will lead you into the land that you are entering. He will for Jesus will force out many nations for you, the Hittites, blah blah blah. Jesus will put these nations under your power, and you will defeat them. You must destroy them completely. Don't make an agreement with them or show them mercy. Now, who's talking here? Jesus is he not? Jesus says, don't marry any of them. Don't let your sons or daughters marry any of them for other nations. If you do, your children will turn away from following Jesus, me. Then your children will serve other gods, and Jesus will be very angry with you. Jesus will be very angry with you, and Jesus will quickly destroy you. Have I done anything wrong by putting Jesus in here? I dare a Christian to say to me, no, Doug, you, Jesus never said these things. Um, this was Yahweh. Or you could say, Yahweh and Jesus, both of them never said these things. This is just man, man's, men's words. Either option you choose, you're, I think you're in trouble at this point. Um, let's pull up one of my favorites, Numbers 31. Of course, Jesus would never say any of these things, right? Uh, Israel fights back. Jesus said to Moses and said, Moses, tell the Israelites this. And then we have all this stuff here. So all this stuff. Now, I know Christians will fight tooth and nail. No, Jesus didn't say these things. And Yahweh didn't say these things. But it says right at the top, Jesus said to Moses. 
And then they pick and choose, some Christians, uh, what Jesus said to Moses and what Jesus didn't say to Moses. Um, let's see here. Uh, so Moses said to the people, the words of Jesus, choose some of your men. Jesus will use these men to do to the Midianites what they did to you. <laughs> uh, so Moses got some men for war. The Israelites fought the Midianites as Jesus had commanded. They fought them how? The way Jesus commanded. They, and what did Jesus command? To kill all the Mid Midianite men. The Israelites took the Midianite women and children as prisoners. They also took their sheep, cattle, and other things. Then they burned the towns, but they weren't supposed to do this. Moses was very angry and said, uh, and Moses said to them, why did you let the women live? These are the women who listened to Balaam and caused the men of Israel to turn away. And so Moses is saying what Jesus told him. Now kill all the Midianite boys and kill the women who have not had sexual relations with a man. You can let all the young girls live. In other words, the virgins. So Jesus told Moses to tell the Israelites to kill everybody except the virgins. Jesus wanted the virgins alive. And then all you men who killed others must stay outside the camp for seven days. Now, I'm, I'm curious. I'm sure there's a lot of Christians saying, no, Doug, you're totally wrong here. But let me ask you this. If this is true, if what I'm saying is true, that Jesus actually said these things to Moses, is this a deal breaker for you? If uh, well, today's Saturday, in the United States, a lot of Christians are going to go worship Jesus tomorrow within hours. If you're a Christian and you're sitting at the pew tomorrow morning in church, and if this thought hits your head that Jesus, because you believe maybe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, if the thought hits your head that Jesus actually said to Moses to kill everybody but the virgins, how in the world can you worship Jesus at that point? Like, can you do it? I couldn't. But if it was true that Jesus actually said kill everybody except for the virgins, Jesus wanted the virgins alive. But can you seriously see yourself worshiping this God? Now, I think some of you <laughs> will say, yeah, sure, why not? Jesus can, can choose who lives, who dies. Jesus is God. Okay. But I think most people have to do what Gregory Boyd's doing here and somehow come up with um, some way to say, no, Jesus never really said that. Um, because if he did, I don't think I could worship him anymore. Um, actually, my friend who has that, again, if you came late, there's a Facebook group called, if you're a Christian listening, there's a Facebook group called Wrestling With... Um, the wrestling with the disturbing parts of scripture on Facebook. It's a Facebook group. It's a closed group, but I'm sure he'll um, have you with open arms. In fact, he's just texted me. His name's Ben. And I asked him, I told him that I would be go doing this. And I asked this Christian guy named Ben, what verses really cause you problems? And he, I'm now looking, says Deut Deuteronomy 7, the one I just put up, where it says, show no mercy. And then he says, Deuteronomy 25, 12. Okay, let's look at that. Now, this is a Christian saying this is what bothers him. Uh, 25. So if you're a Christian listening, maybe you want to help Ben, bring him to the, to the light. <laughs> He'll probably, hi, Ben, you're going to watch this in the replay. Um... Two men might be fighting against each other. One man's wife might come to help her husband, but she must not grab the other man's private parts. <laughs> if she does, cut her hand. Oh, yeah, cut the woman's hand off. Don't feel sorry for her. Oh, for, and he made a note that um, that uh, it sure sounds like uh, Jesus is Yahweh is saying, don't feel sorry for, uh, for cutting her hand off. To me, that one's uh, not as bad as the other ones. Um, but first Samuel 15, uh, 
Now, I, I can hear the response from um, Christians of the Saint. Doug, all you need to do is read this book. Just read this book or that book, and this will all make sense to you. But if you're coming from the position that you believe the whole Bible is the inspired word of a deity, and if you believe this deity is one in three persons, then I can put Jesus' name in here, no problem. Uh, for Samuel 15, one day Samuel said to Saul, the, Jesus sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now listen to Jesus' message. The, the all-powerful Jesus says, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, the Amalekites tried to stop them from going to Canaan. I saw the Amalekites did. Now go fight against the Amalekites, says Jesus. You must completely destroy them and everything that belongs to them, Jesus said. Don't let anything live. You must kill all the men and women and all the children and the little babies, Jesus said. <laughs> you must kill all their cattle and sheep and all their camels and donkeys. I don't understand that, but uh, maybe they were diseased. So if you're a Christian watching, do you, do you believe that Jesus said this as one of the three persons of the Trinity? In the Old Testament, would you believe this is the inspired word of God? Have I done anything wrong here by saying, Jesus said, don't let anything live. You must kill all the men and women and all the children and the little babies. Can you worship Jesus tomorrow knowing that the Jesus you worship, who you say is all loving, if this is true, if it's true that Jesus said, kill the little babies, can you worship that Jesus? If you can, I, I'm sorry, I think something's wrong with you. I really do. I really think you have to come up with some way to say, no, Jesus never said this. And this is what Greg Boyd's doing. Because he needs, he needs Christianity to survive. Let's, number 16, this is Moses. He says, this is how you will know, oh, it's a, a little backdrop. There's some people kind of grumbling against his Coral's rebellion. Right? Yeah, yeah, so Coral's they're not rebellion. too thrilled with Moses, but... So he, he Joe's, uh, is in the live stream chat. He's a Christian. I believe that the authors thought that God told them that, but we're clearly wrong about God. Okay, Joe, you have a problem if that's what you believe. I'm going to now say, um, I believe Mark, you, Ma Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John believed that this is what Jesus said, but they were clearly wrong about Jesus. Why can't I say that? If you can say that about the Old Testament, why can't I say that about the New Testament? Answer me that, Joe. You don't believe the authors thought, you believe that the authors thought God told them that, but, you th but you're saying that the authors of the Old Testament were mistaken, are you not? What if I told you, well, I think the authors of the New Testament are mistaken, and that the authors of the New Testament who portrayed Jesus as loving and, and had the little children sit on his lap, they're clearly wrong, Joe. They're clearly wrong. Because I've experienced the, the wrath of Yahweh. So that's not the portrait of, of Yahweh I know. See, this is the problem. It's like, where do you stop with this thinking if you say, oh, the, these are just men and they got it wrong about who God really is? You can take that same reasoning for the New Testament. He goes out and says, this is how you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things and that it was not my idea. If these men, meaning Korah and the rebellion, is that you, Lord? He's telling me to call a number. I, I hear it. I hear it. He's saying, you're right, Greg. Listen to him. <laughs> if these men die a natural death and suffer the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about something totally new and the earth opens up, its mouth and swallows them with everything that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the realm of the dead, then you will know that these men have treated the Lord with contempt. As soon as he finished saying all this, the ground underneath them split apart, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them all and their households, all those associated with Korah together with their possessions. Lovely. They, were, uh, they went down alive into the realm of the dead with everything they owned. The earth closed over them, and they perished and were gone from the community. That's how you take care of church conflicts. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, now, so, uh, already, if I'm looking at this from the perspective of the cross, my working assumption is going to be, since I really trust that God looks like he is, he's Christ-like, cross-like, all the way down to his very essence. Uh, 
how can you trust anything in the New Testament of what you think Jesus is, who Jesus is? How can you trust that if you don't trust the Old Testament authors? Why do you trust the New Testament authors? I, I am going to assume that something else is going on here for the same reasons that I will trust my wife's character and assume something else is going on. And it may seem implausible, but it's plausible to the degree that I really am convinced. See, everything hangs on our trusting that the cross tells the whole story about what God is like because that's how the New Testament presents it. So I'm trusting this. And so I have to assume that, that, that the violence in this passage was caused by some agent other than God. Now, you may be thinking, well, where's the agent? Because it sounds like the author is just saying God did it. Mm -hmm. Well, here's... Here, here, I found that if I don't find explicit evidence in the narrative itself, I'll find it somewhere else in, in uh, the, 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 the Bible. So read uh, 1 Corinthians 10.10. 10. Mm -hmm. Do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. The destroying angel, that's interesting. <laughs> okay, Paul here, most scholars believe he's talking about Korah's rebellion because that's the most famous account of grumblers. But there's six other accounts of grumblers being punished. Uh, and, and, and he may be referring to... This reminds me of the video I made back about the problem of evil. It's like <clears throat> anything bad in Greg Boyd's mind, anything bad that could happen on planet Earth cannot come from God. Um, any violence, any death, destruction cannot come from God. He can allow it, but it's not directly from him. But, but anything good, I, I, I don't, he hasn't said this yet, but I, I have a feeling that he would say that all, everything good comes from God. It's, it's like tails you win, uh, heads I lose. It's, he set up this position in his mind of this, this caricature of the deity that can do no wrong and is just everything's right. But he's, he has one problem, and that is, and uh, Joe in the live streams kind of hinted towards me that he's an open theist. But still, if this God has any type of power whatsoever or really good at knowing things, he could have created nothing and solved all these problems. He didn't, if he didn't need to create, if he's self-sufficient, if he's all loving and his love doesn't get better by creating, he could have just said, you know what? I'm going to play cosmic golf for eternity. I don't need to create. I don't need to create angels that some of them will fall and one of them will turn into Satan. I don't need to create humans to love me because I'm just fine on my own. Um... So even if you go down this route, Pastor Boyd, of, of God didn't do these things, he just allowed, there's one thing you can't deny. He created. He did do that. And he created, and even if you're an open theist, you can say he created um, with a highly, very good prediction of what would happen. Didn't he even plan redemption because he predicted that it would happen? That's something you can't say God allowed. This is something God actively did. There would be no sin if God did not create anything at all. There'd be no violence, no pain, no suffering if God created nothing at all. One of them, or it could be referring to all of them, but what's interesting is that none of them have a destroying angel. Certainly not Coral's Rebellion. You read that passage and, and it doesn't seem like, where's this destroying angel? And yet, Paul, I think, giving us a revelation here that even though the, the, the narrative itself gives the impression that God was the one who did this, um, Paul says that, no, that there's a different agent involved here. And God... Okay, I have a feeling uh, the rest of the video is going to be basically Boyd saying the same thing over and over again. God didn't do these things, didn't say these things in the Old Testament. It was humans. Um, Adam in the live stream says, Doug, Christians might say it's the God we've got, not the God we want. None of this makes God not real. Sure, they can say that. Uh, but I, Adam, my advice is, is to ask the question I just asked earlier about, um, hey, tomorrow's Sunday. You're about to go to church. If it was true that God said, kill babies, if it's true that Jesus, actually, yeah, don't say God, say Jesus. If it's true that Jesus said, kill babies, can you still worship Jesus? Like, does that affect how you worship Jesus at all? And I don't care if they say cry, appeal to emotion, or whatever. I, we're real human beings. 
And let me put it this way. Um, if I met, let's say I'm single, and I met a woman who 30 years earlier killed a baby and pled guilty, went to jail, all that. I tell you, it'd still be hard for me to marry a woman who killed a baby in her past. I couldn't do it, I don't think. I wouldn't take the chance. It's not worth the risk, especially if I want kids in the future. But yet Christians seem like they will marry Jesus knowing that he killed babies in the past. Am I so different than the average Christian? Keith says, Doug, please pull up the same verse in a more accurate translation. I'm not sure what verse you're talking about. Uh, the, the one he read or the one I read? I'm using the RSV. Oh, no. Actually, sorry, I apologize. I was using a bad translation. I admit that. Uh, you're talking about 1 Samuel 15? I tell you, it, with a lot of these verses, it doesn't matter what version you read. Um, at least, well, I haven't read all versions, but. Doug with his nitpicking. Jesus, uh, let me ask you directly, Jesus Garcia. If it were true that Jesus said, kill little babies, would that affect the way you worship Je uh, Jesus? Do you believe Jesus said that? Why would a Christian want the Old Testament to be true, said for a love of? They, uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I don't think they actually do want some these parts that we're talking about to be true, but they have a problem that if you say the Bible is inspired um, and that these are the very words of God spoken through the pen of men, now not all, not all Christians say that, of course, but if you do say that, you have a problem. I at least think you do. At least existentially you have a problem. Uh, emotionally you have a problem. Uh, and I don't think it's wrong to say that, that, that it doesn't sit well with you. And so you have to be like this Boyd guy and come up with ways to reconcile it. Yeah, God says kill the babies in every version. Again, don't say God. When you're talking to Christians, uh, every time you read the Old Testament, don't say Lord, don't say God. Say put Jesus in there and dare them to, to call you on it. They won't. They might initially, but they're like, oh, I can't really. If they're a Trinitarian, if they're Unitarian, it's different. But if they're a Trinitarian, they're not going to push back because they know if they do, then they're saying, oh, well, wait a minute. I have uh, James White on record saying, yeah, no, there's no problem using Jesus in the Old Testament. If God wiped out unborn babies in a flood, how do you know he's not using abortions in the same way today? <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, I understand for a love of. It was rhetorical. So this is a real issue for, I don't know how many Christians, but I would say a, a pretty large percentage. Um, I would say a large percentage are not even aware of these verses uh, that call themselves Christians. I would say of that percentage who are not even aware, when they do become aware, it bothers them greatly. Keith asks, Doug, is it wrong to kill babies if they go to heaven? <laughs> well, that's what uh, William Lane Craig says, right? Um, really, the, whenever God sanctions something, it's tr right by definition. Oh, and if you're a non-Christian listening, don't get, 
looped into this idea, well, Doug, are you saying killing babies is wrong based on what standard? Just say, um, don't use the words wrong or right. Just ask them, do you think Jesus said this? Yes or no? If they say yes, say, how does it um, affect the way you worship to Jesus, Jesus when you go to church and you're, you know, those praise songs that they play, you raise your hands and you're worshiping a baby killer? Does that affect you at all? <laughs> These are the questions. You, there's very practical, down-to-earth questions you need to ask. Well, actually, what verse, uh, speaking of abortion, Adam, let me, <laughs> oh, what is it? Numbers? Someone help me out. The, the abortion, um, where God sanctions abortion. I know Christians are screaming right now. Hear me out. Uh, is it Numbers 7, 9, 5? It's an odd number, I think. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The special uh, drink? Yes, here it is, Numbers 5. Oh, and let me put the, um, this is a real funny translation. It's called uh, easy to read version. Read the Old Testament on Bible Gateway and set it to the easy to read version. It's basically, you know, this whole words like thigh to rot. Um, no, they don't, they s <laughs> say it, uh, very modern language. Um so this is Numbers 5, uh, verse 19, then the priest will make. So basically, you have a man who thinks his woman's been che uh, cheating on him, his wife's been cheating on him and having sex, and um, the priest will make the woman promise to tell the truth. Now this is, let me scroll up here. Um, the Lord said to Moses. So Jesus is saying to Moses, th these are the rules for jealous husbands. So Oh, it says right here, Jesus says to Moses, tell the Israelites this, a man's wife might be unfaithful to him. And now let me scroll down. So, um, but if you have sinned against your husband, if you've had sexual relations with a man who is not your husband, then you are not pure. If that is true, you will have much trouble when you drink this special water. So the priest, Jesus told um, the priest to make this special water. You will not be able to have any children. If you are pregnant now, your baby will die. And the Lord will cause your people to speak evil of you and curse you. So this is Jesus in this translation. Now, I, I guarantee you Christians will fight tooth and nail and say this has nothing to do with abortion. But if this woman has cheated on the husband and she drinks this water, and if, 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 please hear me. I'm going to say the word if three times. If, if, if this woman is pregnant, that baby will die with Jesus' blessing because she was unfaithful to her husband, because Jesus said this to Moses. I think even guys like James White, they kind of, yeah, I can see that's one you know, way to look at it. <laughs> really, um, genocide's not genocide, it's justice when God sanctions it. Murder is not murder. It's justice when God sanctions it. Abortion is not abortion. It's justice when God sanctions it. When your standard of what's right and wrong is Yahweh, when it's Jesus, anything this God says, does, wills, decrees, is good by definition. You have, Christians have no right, they have forfeited the right to judge their God as good or bad. It's just good by definition. So if you're a Christian who has trouble with these Old Testament atrocities, suck it up. Grow a pair. Don't be a wuss. Don't be a weak-kneed liberal. Say, own it. Yes, Jesus killed babies. You have a problem with that, Doug? You know, that's how you're, you should respond to me. Keith asks, Doug, where's our friend Mike Winger we need, when we need him? Uh, yes, um, I don't think Mike Winger is very happy with me from the, my last video of Cam 
40 minutes of Cam Unleashed. <laughs> uh, he, we had a little nice back and forth on Twitter uh, yesterday. So, well, uh, I almost said gentlemen because I just assume there's no women watching. But um, if you're a woman and you're watching this or in the replay, thank you for being here. You're one in ten. You're special. Any woman who watches my videos is very, very special. I want to give a shout out to Ben. His Facebook group is Wrestling with the Disturbing Parts of Scripture. If you're a Christian and you watch this replay and you struggle with this, go to his channel. He's pretty open and honest about these things. Oh, and also shout out to Doug Bean. Please correct me if any, I made any mistakes. Thanks for hanging out, guys, on a Saturday night here in the U.S. And may science bless you.